Hello again. Before we begin, a fair warning, this is probably going to be a long one, so get ready. In my earlier video, The Theory of Everything, I made passing mention of my belief that the universe is fractally symmetrical, much like a snowflake. At the time, I thought this was a relatively straightforward concept, and felt it meandered too much from the topic at hand to expound on there and then, but now I'm starting to second-guess myself. The only problem is I don't think I could make a compelling script on that idea alone, so I'm wrapping it up in another topic to hopefully give a more illustrative framework for my original thought. Hopefully that made sense. So where do I begin? Well, I suppose a few definitions might be in order. Let's work from the ground up. Fractal, an irregular geometric structure wherein patterns repeat across layers of magnification. Symmetry. The correspondence in size, form, and arrangement of parts on opposite sides of a plane, line, or point. Ergo, a system or structure with fractal symmetry is one wherein observable patterns repeat across layers or dimensions of complexity. Now, if that all sounded like the drunken ravings of the bastard love spawn of the Matrix architect and RN Jesus, don't worry, you're not alone. As I stated last time, humans are a race of complexity and, more pertinently for this video, contradictions. The first and foremost of which I believe to be this. The drive to live versus the drive to be efficient. What does this have to do with symmetry? Just bear with me while I take you on a journey that will either be a grand philosophical romp or the mental equivalent of me getting hit by a train while trying to walk up the stairs. All right. Now the first thing we need to understand is that, like all life, humans have a deeply ingrained desire for self-preservation an instinct rivaled in strength only by its congenitally mated partner, reproduction. Both of these have two common aspects. One, they are intrinsically selfish. Two, they are both strictly absolutist in their approach, allowing neither for caveat nor nuance. I'll come around to point one again in a bit. But for right now, point two is most concerning because it contradicts our third most basic instinct, which I'm going to go ahead calling the reductive instinct. The reductive instinct is the seedbed from which our ability to reason first germinated. It decrees efficiency in all things. It is the whole reason we have a brain at all, to restrict action and thus curtail the needless expenditure of valuable calories, which throughout most of our evolutionary life cycle have been precariously hard to come by. By seeing to it, we don't do things that don't lead us anywhere or make the same stupid mistakes over and over and over again. In summary, on the one hand, our instincts say, do everything in your power to survive and reproduce, and on the other hand, tell us, don't do needless things. The problem is when we introduce the third wheel of sentience and the awareness of our immutable expiration date, which, when further magnified through the lens of cultural memory and historical record, reveals the humbling frailty and ultimate inconsequentiality of all things. So the great question now is, if the fate of all life is death no matter what, then what's even the point of living? Or to put it another way, if the final result of every action is oblivion, what's the point of doing anything? Again, you might ask what this has to do with symmetry. Well, if the universe can be thought of as an egg and we're the chicken, then the question is why the chicken should lay eggs. Okay, okay, cringy Reddit pseudo-philosophy aside, the fact that comparison made logical sense to you is the point, but it still doesn't answer the question. Why does a chicken lay eggs? Why does it eat? Why does it cross the road? There, you knew I had to. But why? To make more chickens? To make more eggs? Why does it care? Why do we? Well, in order to understand that we have to get one more quick definition out of the way first, that is what we mean by the term logic, what does it mean to be logical? It's quite simple. Logic is the internal continuity of a pattern. The laws of physics tell us matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, that nothing can come out of nowhere, and that nothing can happen for no reason. Reason being the intellectual pursuit of the logic of things. Ergo, nothing can be arbitrary, and there can be no contradictions. But herein, the observant listener will say, lies the flaw in this video's logic. Did I not just spend the past two minutes laying out as many fundamental contradictions in the human condition? How can we exist then? What makes us so special that we can just ignore the basic rules of existence? Well, there's a simple and a correct answer to this. The short answer is, we can't. 
The slightly longer and nigh infinitely more complicated answer is we can't, but we can circumnavigate the actual problem by using our relatively advanced powers of imagination ironically granted by our capacity for reason. For millennia, we've traditionally done this by A, inventing magical alternatives to arbitrary oblivion, be they in the form of heaven or an infinite respawn cycle, and B, pretending there is in fact some grand encompassing purpose belying everything, but that it's just too impossibly awesome for our tiny minds to encompass it. I don't know about you, but that all sounds like a lot of childish obfuscation and mindless juvenile wish fulfillment to me. In the absence of objective evidence to their credit, gods and lives after can only exist if you are willing to believe in magic. Magic being the art of invoking supernatural forces to influence the material world in ways that defy all known laws of reality. In essence, in order for the theologians to be right, reality must be wrong. Or, as Leo Tolstoy put it, I can find nothing in the way of reason save a denial of life, and I can find nothing in the way of faith save a denial of reason, a thing even more impossible than a denial of life. So what do we do now? deny any real understanding of existence for empty faith in a prettier fantasy? Well, as far as I can see, the best answer came from Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Quote, if there's any great truth behind anything, it's that the entire infinity of creation is being run by a bunch of maniacs, and the best thing for it is to say, hang the sense of it, and just try to keep yourself occupied. Unquote. The fact that we are all still here tells us that, in the war between self-preservation and reason, self-preservation obviously won out. But how? We obviously still retain some affinity for logic, our somewhat flaky applications of it notwithstanding. So what happened? Well, the Cliff Notes version is that we substituted real understanding of and substantive meaning in the universe for gods and magic. But then God died. How? By the hand of the modern empirical methods of science, we dissected God, lay his component parts out and called them by their real names, biology, astronomy, geology, mathematics, physics, etc. But in doing so, we also unwittingly unleashed the black dragon of nihilism God was keeping safely locked behind the pearly gates. One which we were woefully unprepared to combat, thanks to our compulsive castration of our higher faculties. Now we have its cold teeth clasped tight about our necks, just as great foreseers like Nietzsche and all the emotional monkeys on the religious right knew would happen. So the great question then is, what now? As I expressed in detail in my other video, I believe as Nietzsche did that we are at a crossroads. Do we raise up our father's sword or do we run and hide behind a new made-up father figure and hope the darkness just forgets about us and leaves? Hopefully you can glean from my words which path I hope the rest of humanity chooses. But in the end, I suppose, just as a human body is made up of a million million molecular protein chains, which are themselves composed of a harmony of interlaced atoms and their constituent particles, the fate of humanity at large ultimately rests on each of our individual choices and actions. And just as how it is every animal's nature to want and fend for itself above all else, because in the end, it knows that nobody and nothing else in existence gives a damn. It should be the first nature and goal of every sentient soul to conquer life's mysteries, to live, and ultimately to die, on their own terms. This is how we become gods. Not by groveling, not by pitying ourselves, but by standing up and facing our tyrannical father. By casting ourselves out of heaven and into the verdant, untapped reaches of hell, and from there finding our way out into Eden. Just remember... Contrary to what many covetous despots would tell you, there are no good or bad choices. There are only consequences. Now choose.